name is Jacob Lumoff. I'm a research scientist at HRL Laboratories. I'm happy to talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing um, with triple dot qubits and particularly um, how we quantify highly performant uh, state preparation measurement. So to preface this, I'm going to talk a little bit about exchange only qubits because not a ton of people use them. Um, but it's our, our preferred qubit at HRL. Uh, they've got a few advantages. So uh, we only need baseband electronics for control and measurement, which means we don't need to fabricate things like uh, micromagnets. We don't need lasers. Um, we avoid some of the bulky RF equipment and integration hit that other schemes use. Um, and we're also immune to fluctuations on the global B field. Now, there's some cost to that. So I've got a microscope, a microscope image of uh, two exchange-only qubits here. You can see that's six dots in a row, and that means we need three dots for each qubit. So that's an overhead cost. Um, secondly, because we're going to be encoding our uh, you know, two-dimensional qubit in a larger space, uh, we can leak out of that logical space. And in particular, that's going to be driven by magnetic field gradients. So preparing these qubits is pretty straightforward. Um, the logical zero state is just a spin singlet on these outer two dots, spins one and two. We actually don't have to prepare the third spin. There's a gauge freedom there. The logical one state is a little more complicated. The gauge spin does come back into the picture. But the important thing for spam is to note that when you project spins one and two, they always look triplet-like. And what that means is that uh, spam for exchange-only qubits is similar to uh, that of double quantum dot singlet triplet qubits, which people might be a little bit more familiar with. So once we've done preparation on these qubits, we can do uh, uh, SU2 rotations. In particular, if I put a voltage on this x1 gate, I'm going to apply a rotation around the z axis of my block sphere. Alternately, if I apply a voltage on this x2 gate, I'm going to rotate my logical state around this weird n axis, which is uh, 120, degrees, 120 degrees off from the z axis. Um, that's a relatively strange thing, uh, axis to rotate around, but we can use it to generate universal control and create Cliffords. Um, and in the past, we've shown that we can do single qubit Clifford errors um, a little under the 1e minus 3 level. One of the takeaways of this talk is going to be that we can get spam errors on a sort of similar scale to those Clifford errors. So my other interest slide is talking a little bit about spam fidelity. Um, so what do I mean when I talk about spam fidelity? Uh, so, so preparation and measurement are what bound the probability of your algorithm working when sort of everything else, your CNOTs, your Cliffords, whatever, goes right. And what that means is that when we want to talk about a quoted spam error, it really needs to come from qubit measurements. Um, and in particular, it has to come from the full thresholds of, uh, full statistics of threshold measurements, which means we need to be very careful when we're talking about post selection. And generally, like things like S and R aren't particularly good proxies for spam fidelity. So why do we care about spam fidelity? Um, well, anyone who cares about qubits probably cares about spam fidelity. If you're uh, making a NISC machine, as your circuit gets wider, you're going to care about um, your runtime is going to increase very quickly with spam errors. Um, if you're into quantum networking, uh, your teleportation and purification protocols are going to depend very strongly um, on the quality of your measurements. Of course, in fault-tolerant quantum computing, you have to be underneath a certain threshold rate. And you'd like to be really quite far underneath that threshold. Um, and lastly, if you're doing quantum sensing, uh, spam errors will also slow down and degrade the precision of your quantum sensors. So everybody who cares about qubits should care about spam. So the bulk of my talk is going to be in three parts. Uh, the first section, I'm going to talk about the physics of our measurement. I'm going to pay special attention to um, the imperfections and where sources of error come from. Uh, in the middle, I'm going to do a short section on our initialization routine. Um, and then the third section is going to talk about the different uh, ways we can put these together, the different experiments we can do, and numbers we can generate um, to try to quantify that performance. And in, as well, I'll uh, compare um, our sort of predicted and observed performance. So let's talk about measurement. So uh, the field of spin qubit measurement is, is uh, very broad. There's a lot of people doing a lot of different techniques. I couldn't possibly talk about them all here. Um, generally speaking, they all come in two steps. There's a spin to charge conversion step followed by a charge measurement step. Um, there's uh, various options for each of these. Here, we're going to be using poly spin blockade. Um, and then we're going to be uh, finishing our measurement up with a dot charge sensor. And this is in comparison to a lot of uh, modern techniques that are using 
RF-based techniques, which have shown some really impressive results. Um, but we think our results are pretty good, too, and we don't have to bring in some of that uh, bulky overhead associated with RF routines. So uh, starting with spin blockade. So uh, obviously, electron spins are very small. They're very hard to measure. That's a good thing. It makes them good qubits. Um, it's a bad thing, because I can't do my measurements. Um, but electrons are here to help us out. Um, in particular, we can admix the spin and charge degrees of freedom. And we get to do that because electrons are fermions. And fermions have to be, have an overall anti-symmetric wave function. Uh, the spin singlet is an anti-symmetric spin state. The triplet is a symmetric spin state. And if I try to shove two electrons in one dot, their ground orbital state is also symmetric. And what that means is that uh, a spin singlet will happily occupy uh, both electrons in one dot. However, to uh, put a spin triplet into the same dot, um, I have to enter an excited state. And what that means is that as I move from my 1-1 one, one bias, um, where my qubit is, is centered, and as I move towards the 2-0-1 bias, um, there is a regime in which the singlet happily uh, transfers that electron over, um, but the triplet sort of refuses until I get to a higher energy state. And if I stop at a detuning right in the middle there, I've uh, strongly admixed the spin and charge degrees of freedom. At that point, I can turn around and measure the charge state. So uh, we measure our uh, charge state using a dot charge sensor. If you see, here's the three dots of my qubit. Um, this dot represents a measurement dot. Um, it has a bath, an electron bath on either side, a source and a drain. And we bias it up into a Coulomb peak regime where the current or the uh, conductance of that dot is a very strong function of the potential. And in fact, what we do is we sit right here on a point of high derivative of that conductance peak. And if we monitor the current that flows uh, through the dot charge sensor, we can see very clearly when the nearby charge environment changes the potential at that dot charge sensor. Of course, if we back out a little bit, we could talk about the whole signal chain. Um, we generate a signal at room temperature using uh, a DAC, uh, attenuate it, send it down into the fridge. It goes uh, through our dot charge sensor. We run that current um, into a sense resistor, which converts the current information into voltage information, and then amplify it with a two-stage cryogenic hemp before digitizing at room temperature. Now, I said we work at baseband. Uh, that's broadly true. We actually do modulate our measurement signal. Uh, we modulate it about one megahertz, so this is a representative um, signal. And that's demodulated in software. This technique helps us mitigate low-frequency noise. Um, they're not going so far as to uh, get into the RF measurement regime. So when we put that together, um, and I could try to measure a qubit state, I can get histograms. So here's histograms of the dot charge sensor current. Um, as you can see, they're nicely separated. But the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do that as a function of the detuning of the point at which I do this measurement. Now, as I move all the way to low detuning in the negative side, I'm always in the 1-1 one, one charge occupancy. But as I move to high detuning, I'm always in the 2-0 charge occupancy. If I look in the middle, I can see very clearly the physics of where the singlet branch transitions the charge state um, before the triplet branch transitions. And if I sit right in the middle, that point of maximum separation um, is where I have the highest SNR. These two branches are separated by the two electron excited state splitting. Um, and we actually think this is a pretty useful tool to measure that splitting in situ. And for most of the data here, um, that two electron splitting is going to be about 150 microEV. So I've told you about how things can go right. Uh, let's talk about how things can go wrong. So there's a few factors that can start to cause errors. And when you're uh, trying to budget the quality of your measurement, first you're going to run into three factors, which is the amplitude of your signal, the amplitude of your noise, and any relaxation that might happen during your measurement process. And I like to point out that all three of these are sort of interrelated to each other, and optimizing it can be a tricky uh, problem. As I change my readout chain, I'm going to find that it affects both my signal and my noise. Um, the presence of a finite T1 limits how long I can integrate and how long I can beat down that noise. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about this a little bit later in, in uh, this presentation, but as I try to make my signal bigger and bigger, I find that I can actually start inducing a T1 process. In addition to those, um, there's also sometimes a mapping error in an architecture, which is when you move your device from a configuration where you're doing your quantum gates to a configuration where you're ready to do your measurement. Um, and that'll come back in as well.
So as I try to budget those three uh, components, I'll start with the simplest one, which is the noise. Um, when we set up this configuration right here, what we've done is we've taken the three main white noise components, um, which is noise from the cryogenic hemp, Johnson noise from the shunt resistor, and then uh, shot noise from the DCS current itself. And these are all about of a similar magnitude. Furthermore, um, the dot charge sensor itself experiences a 1 over F charge noise process. So if I take those together and I integrate them with the filter function of our measurement, we predict signal noise on the order of 5 to 10 picoamps, uh, which, is, which is pretty accurately what we observe. And I'll call out as well that this is not including some of the more uh, tricky noise sources. If you have grounding issues um, and you can see noise from your turbo pumps um, or your thermometry, um, those are going to come into play in a more complicated fashion. So when I talk about the signal budget, I like to break it down into four components. Um, first is the signal to charge conversion efficiency, which is sort of how efficiently can I uh, admix the spin and charge degrees of freedom. And that's broadly a statement of, is this separation between these branches broader than the line width of the individual transitions? Um, and it, it approaches one as that, as that becomes true. Um, so you know, there's two things we can do to improve that. We can make the excited state splitting larger. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we'd want to do that, um, but it's kind of hard. Um, secondly, we can try to make that line width narrower. And that's a function of your tunnel coupling, your effective temperature. Uh, and what we find as you get narrower and narrower, your um, charge noise comes into play as well. The second component is the magnitude of the potential shift at the charge, sen dot charge sensor. Once I change the charge states under the P dots, how much does that affect the DCS current? Um, this is the easiest component here. Um, it's just a matter of basically Coulomb's law, um, and geometry of your device, and accounting for image charges. The third one is exactly how sharp can I make my Coulomb peak? Um, this is a pretty old uh, bit of physics. There's, there's been a lot of work there. I'm not going to get into it. Um, but it depends on a lot of factors, like your uh, temperature, the excited state structure, tunneling rate, um, symmetry of the dot charge sensor. Um, so there's a lot going on there. And then the last factor is, well, once I have this conductance, how much voltage can I actually apply? Um, there's a few things that can happen here. You can start broadening the charge sensor. Um, you might even saturate your readout chain. And it, as we'll talk about again, we'll, you can induce a T1 process. So if I put the signal and noise together, I get S and R. Right? Um, and here's some experimental data where on the y-axis, I'm increasing how long I integrate for. And on the x-axis, I'm changing uh, exactly how hard I'm trying to drive this dot charge sensor. And as you can see, as I move from zero integration time, I have very little signal. As I move up it, I get more signal. Um, and that increases until it starts to asymptote. And it's asymptoting there um, at an SNR of about 17, where I've beaten down um, the white noise with averaging, uh, but the 1 over F noise is, is really started leading to diminishing returns. On the other axis, I can start with a very small source drain bias. And I get, of course, no signal as I try to uh, bias harder and harder, I start getting more and more signal. And then as I go too far, um, I've started to induce Coulomb broadening, and my signal starts going away again. So if I try to look at the fast limit of this, at a little bit under a microsecond, I can reach an SNR of 6.5. Uh, that leads to a bound on my spam fidelity of about 60 minus 4, um, which, is, which is pretty healthy. Um, on the other hand, if I try to maximize my SNR, I can integrate for, for quite a bit longer. Here it's, it's 20 microseconds. Um, and here I can obtain an SNR of 15 and a half, which is really uh, quite exceptional. It puts a fidelity bound of 5e e minus 15, which is a, a sort of preposterous number. Um, so of course, I'm not limited by SNR at those levels. And as you can see by just looking in at these histograms, um, right here, these points in the middle indicate T1 or a decay process during the measurement. Um, so that's going to be a, a stronger limit. Uh, secondly, I can see these little uh, wings here, um, which are sort of small effects, but either indicate some sort of non-Gaussian noise process, or perhaps that I'm actually having some small probability of populating another charge state. The third component uh, was T1 in the measurement window. So what do I mean by T1? Um, I mean that I'm going from a 1-1 one, one triplet uh, down to a 2-0 singlet. That means there's a charge relaxation process and a spin mixing process. Um, or perhaps I'm doing some co-tunneling process directly with the electron bath. So the physics here um, is incredibly rich. There's, there's a lot to say, and I, I'll just barely scratch the surface. 
But as we look in the charge processes, of course, you have things like phonons, you have 1 over f noise. Um, all of these noise sources have an effect that scales like the dipole moment, so something like Tc squared. Um, but they can have various detuning dependencies as I sweep that axis. On the spin side of things, you know, we're mostly talking about uh, hyperfine physics, um, but the, there's a few different effects that can happen here, uh, and they have very complex dependencies. Um, these tend to scale like the energy differences there, which means we can pick up hot spots uh, that represent some excited state structure. Um, and they also can counteract these Tc squared terms, so that's not always the direction to optimize T1. The co-telling processes, we're uh, relatively confident that we can suppress exponentially by pulling back on the bath gates uh, during the measurement process. So let's talk about some data. Um, here is going to be some measured T1. My routine starts um, by initializing, um, getting a nice fresh uh, spin singlet. I'm going to go somewhere in the measure window um, and do some trial measurements um, where I can change some parameters like amplitude or detuning. Um, but I'm not actually going to record the measurements there. What I'm going to do afterwards is go back and do a calibrated measurement and just see what happened to my original spin state. So here's a set of data on the y-axis. Um, I'm changing how long uh, I do this trial measurement for. Um, and on the x-axis, I'm sweeping the detuning between 1, 1, and 2, 0. Um, and I'm looking at the return probability. So clearly, we can see some structure. We can see some things that get worse with time. That'll make sense. Uh, to try to put this in context, um, I could try to actually uh, anchor that x-axis by going back to those uh, poly spin blockade histograms that I showed earlier. Now what I've done is I've fit that and I'm overlaying an iso contour. So you can see here is where the singlet branch transitions and here's where the triplet branch transitions. And so most of this structure is at a fairly small detuning, uh, though there's a little bit more structure in the 2-0 bias. And if I fit these, um, I can get decay rates, of course. They're fairly exponential. Um, and we can see how that decay rate changes. Clearly, those, those peaks show up. Uh, one takeaway here is that you know, in a regime where we still have relatively high SNR, I can reach a T1 of, say, 30 um, milliseconds, which compares pretty favorably to our measurement time of one microsecond. Now, when we get into to really high performances, um, just optimizing SNR isn't enough. So what I've done in this plot is I've shown SNR. I've calculated the infidelity from, from uh, you know, finite SNR. And I've also calculated the infidelity from T1 processes. And when I add those together and try to predict my overall error, um, I can see that the minimum error point is, in fact, offset from the maximum SNR. So as you're trying to get to high levels of performance, um, it's important to, to not just maximize that SNR. Um, as an aside, a neat little bit of uh, open physics I'd like to call out. We often notice that there's a T1 process that can scale very quickly um, with how large that source strain bias is. Um, and here I'm showing an inverse T1 versus that bias. Um, and as you can see, it, it, it turns on pretty quickly. Uh, this is probably due to phonons generated by the dot charge sensor. But again, it's, it's kind of an open question as to exactly what's going on here. Um, and it's fairly important because this limits exactly how hard we can measure. So uh, switching gears into initialization. So as we discussed, due to poly spin blockade, once I'm biased in the 2-0 cell, there's an energy difference between the singlet and triplet spin states. Um, and you know, we could just wait T1, but as I also showed, T1 can be quite long. Uh, so what's faster than that is to just go to the 2 dag electron bath um, and ask for some fresh electrons, which, which are thermalized to a much colder state. So uh, we go to this 1, 0 to 2, 0 uh, transition point, at which point there's enhanced tunneling between the bath and my p dot um, within a certain window set by the excited state energy that we can call the initialization window. Um, ideally, at the end of this, I should end up in a Boltzmann distribution, which is given by my two electron excited state energy. Um, and the effective electron temperature of the bath. In the bottom right, I'm showing some experimental data where I'm sweeping these P1 and P2 biases um, right on that transition. Um, but the signal is the difference of two experiments. One of the experiments is where I initialize or try to initialize um, and then do a poly spin blockade measurement, or where I fully dephase and do a poly spin blockade measurement. And obviously, you're only going to get a signal there when your initialization actually does something. And that's what this yellow bar is. 
roughly set by the uh, its width roughly set by the amplitude of the excited state splitting. So one thing I'll call out is if I zoom out a little bit, um, this was at the one to two electron uh, transition. If I go over here to the two to three electron transition, I see a much brighter signal. Um, and it's much wider. Um, it also tends to, uh, it initializes much faster, which I think is, is relatively well understood. Um, but exactly why it's wider um, isn't as understood. Um, so I think there's uh, some room for, for people to dig into to those rate equations. But in, empirically, it's, it's almost universally better to do initialization over at this 2 to 3, 0 um, transition. So the next question then is how fast can I initialize? So as we're limited by tunneling back and forth between the p dot and the bath, um, you'd think you can go faster and faster by lowering this barrier um, in between the two. And, and indeed, you can. Um, but there's some, some practical limitations as we try to go really fast. The first of them is as I push very hard on that tunnel barrier, I'm actually distorting the electron wave function. And if I make it particularly asymmetric, I can actually bring down the two electron orbital energy, um, at which point that might start limiting our Boltzmann distribution and spoiling the ultimate fidelity of our initialization. Uh, secondly, uh, this can be really quite sensitive to the bias um, of your applied voltage waveform, uh, much more so than, say, in a J pulse. And in fact, that's the limitation in this data set. And you can see that in this, uh, this data set here, where here I'm cutting across um, this P1 bias window. And then I'm changing the length of time that I'm trying to initialize. initialize. Now, we know that there's a window where this should work. Um, but we'd expect that uh, it should be sort of exponential in time. And what we see here is that, in fact, it's not even monotonic in time. There's this sort of swoosh shape as the waveform is settling. Um, and in this case, I can get my maximum initialization um, somewhere in this region uh, in the ballpark of about 300 nanoseconds, which is, which is pretty fast. Um, but I'm unable to go faster right now. All right, uh, in the last section, let's talk about quantifying these, these errors. Um, so I generally bulk spam error metrics into two categories. Uh, first of all, there's your summary numbers, which are sort of the reported high-level performance. Um, and then there's diagnostic metrics, which you use to try to understand what's going on. Now, when it comes to the summary metrics, there's a few desiderata I'm going to lay out. Um, I want the initialization measurement to reflect being in a qubit-ready state. Second, I don't want to be cheated by biased error. If, uh, if my um, measurement errors bias me in one way, I want that to cause my fidelity to look worse. Um, second, I don't, or thirdly, I don't want this to be gameable by sacrificing other um, elements of qubit performance. I want that to be obvious. I am fine with it conflating initialization and measurement errors. Um, they tend to be hard to tease apart in a particularly rigorous way. Um, and the downstream effects are largely congruent. For diagnostic metrics, I certainly do want to be able to separate those uh, metrics and, and further tease apart where my error sources are coming from. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to require these strict requirements on those, but, but you should be careful. So the simplest possible metric that I could do um, is just you know, go to some deface state where I have some mixture of singlets and triplets try to do my initialization, and then immediately measure and see how often I get singlets. Um, and when I do that and I sweep it as a function of uh, the initialization time, I get this uh, curve here. And you see that, again, at about 300 nanoseconds, um, I can reach a triplet population of about 60 minus 4, which is, which is pretty good. Um, how does that stack up to prediction? OK, well, the Boltzmann distribution itself would predict around 40 minus 4. Um, when I take into account my independently measured T1, I predict 70 minus 4. So it's sort of right on the money. Um, but this is not qubit ready. I never went to a bias regime uh, where I was ready to do qubit operations. Um, it can be cheated by bias. Anything that causes me to measure uh, singlets is going to make my fidelity look better. Um, and I certainly never showed you that I still had good qubit performance. So we can fix the first one of those. Um, by dephasing, going to our initialization, and then forcing us to go back to the center of the 1, 1 bias um, before we do our measurement. That means we're ready to do qubit operations. And it's going to bring in some of those mapping errors that I talked about earlier. Um, in particular, that's going to be things like dephasing and Landau-Zener. Uh, 
Um, and and uh, sort of optimizing um, these parameters can be a little non-trivial as they're often in tension with each other. Um, so, so this is nice. I am I'm qubit ready, uh, though I haven't solved either of my other problems. Um, in this data set, I now get a triplet fraction of 80 minus 4. Uh, so with 60 minus 4, when I didn't go back to idle, um, 84 now, 80 minus 4 now, that discrepancy is explained really well um, just by T2 star and dephasing in my 1 1 stay. Um, but let's go on to the next one. So, so both of the previous metrics required that I, so I, I sort of get a high score when I measure singlets, right? Um, but a good metric would require both that I measure singlets well and that I measure triplets well. And the simplest experiment I can do that generates triplets um, is a Robbie curve. So here's a set of data. I start in the singlet. I'm sweeping how hard I do my exchange pulse. Um, and I go from singlet down to triplet and back again. And I can come up with a fidelity metric that's given by the contrast of this curve. Now, if you're paying careful attention, you'll see that it actually doesn't go from 1 down to 0. Um, it only goes down to about 25%. That's not because of spam errors. Uh, that's because, again, these are exchange-only qubits. And I have this weird n-axis that, that rotates um, around this weird axis and only takes me down to 25% population. So as I zoom in, you see here's 25%. We don't quite get there, but we do get quite close. Um, if I use this contrast to estimate a fidelity, um, I get about 2.80 minus 3. Now, that's still pretty good spam performance, but it's three times higher than I was talking about earlier. Um, so what's going on there? Uh, the first thing you might think of is, OK, I'm doing Robbie oscillations. I'm sensitive to charge noise. Uh, maybe that's spoiling it. Um, but if I were to look at a Robbie oscillation decay curve, I would really only expect charge noise to add somewhere in the ballpark of 1e minus 4. Um, so that's not uh, quite sufficient to explain it. So let's go on to my fourth and final metric and see if that helps. So our fourth metric, and the last one I'm going to talk about, comes from randomized benchmarking. Uh, that's a little bit strange. We go to randomized benchmarking to get rid of spam errors. Um, but here we're bringing it back. Um, in particular, I'm going to do a routine called blind randomized benchmarking. That means I do two experiments. One is the sort of normal randomized benchmarking curve, where my Clifford sequence compiles to the identity. Um, and the second is one where I've chosen uh, the return pulse such that my Clifford sequence compiles to a pi pulse. Now, I could fit those um, and evaluate the contrast between those two curves. And in particular, I can extrapolate that back to zero Cliffords. So this attempts to remove any contrast loss induced by my pulses. Um, and we also like it because it's sort of highly operational, which means if you've done something that sacrifices qubit performance, um, it's going to show up. So in this particular case, uh, we've got a qubit error about 1.70 minus 3. It's pretty nice. Um, it predicts a spam fidelity of about 2.5 minus 3. Uh, so that's very consistent with the fidelity measured from our Robbie contrast. And it doesn't, um, at this point, tell us where that extra error is coming from. So our best guess at this extra error is that it's coming from preparing into singlet-like excited states um, or excited states of the gauge electron. Um, in general, our missing contrast is singlet-like. Uh, that's consistent with a lot of these models. Um, if I go to some older data here, I'm showing uh, some, some Robbie evolution um, in a device that had a, a smaller two electron splitting. When you looked at the uh, time domain of Robbie evolution, you saw very clearly that there were two different frequencies going on. There's two populations that you're averaging over, which could lead to this sort of an effect. So in the current qubit, I can look at time Robbie oscillations um, and look at their Fourier transforms. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't see any second peaks. Now, that might be because they're not there, uh, but it could also be because I'm looking for a population at this 1.5e e minus 3 level, and this just isn't sensitive enough. So it's certainly an open problem, um, exactly what's going on here and how best to measure it. So takeaways from my talk, uh, these exchange-only qubits, they can be pretty good. Um, their spam errors can be pre pretty good, as well as their, their Cliffords. Um, that said, um, you know, at the edges, there's still some interesting open questions. Um, this T1 versus readout bias, this three electron initialization, uh, detecting small dual frequency populations. Um, and then you know, there's several uh, reasonable spam metrics to choose. Um, and different ones can elucidate in different ways or, or potentially mislead, so you need to choose them carefully. Uh, so thanks for your time. And uh, my last slide, we're uh, hiring everywhere, all across the board. Come work for us.
Thanks again.